right? So when Keith and I were plotting and planning and strategizing about what we wanted this to feel like, we did not want it to be him removed from you guys behind a podium, right? We've all seen enough of those. Um, they have a place. I like those, you know, when you're talking to 250 people and you're at the Georgia Aquarium and there's a stage and all that. Where we really differentiate ourselves as business clubs is you being able to have access to busy business leaders, right? So you're not watching Keith and yes, feeling inspired by his comments, but, but you're not able to interact with him. If you came with a question prepared, you're not able to get an answer. So that's where these speaker series um, are a little different. And for those of you who've come to the last two, we had Kwame Johnson, the CEO for Big Brothers Big Sisters, last month. The month before that, we had Steph Stephanie Stuckey. I know some of you were there for that. She's the CEO for Stuckey's. Um, and just the ability for our members and their guests to be able to interact with and hear from these leaders makes these really unique and really special. Okay, so if this is your first one, I hope it's not your last, um, but we are gonna do Q&A. So I say that, so take notes, write down comments, um, quotes from Keith, and then at the end we'll do some Q&A with you guys as the audience, okay? All right, so we're gonna start big picture and then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty details. So Keith, how would you say that your career path, which has evolved um, over your decades of doing what you do, how did you get started? Oh, wow. Go all the way back. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I think it's important to note that uh, I grew up in rural North Carolina um, to parents who were second generation tenant farmers. And there were not um, a lot of business people, there were not, not a lot of entrepreneurs. We were all blue collar workers, uh, farmers, factory workers, and the like. But what I saw every day. Uh, were individuals who got up every morning, went to work, came home, saved their money, had plans. Uh, they were disciplined. They were uh, committed to providing a, a solid foundation for themselves and for their children. And personal accountability uh, was the thing as I got a little older that I started to understand that that's what my parents and, and my cousins and my aunts and uncles were all about. Uh, I never heard people make excuses mm -hmm. about not doing something. It was, we need to do this, you go do it. If you didn't get it done, there were consequences. And as, as I matriculated through school, uh, expectations were set. Uh, I was not allowed to miss school uh, under almost any circumstances. Uh, and I can say from the first grade to the 12th grade, I had perfect attendance. Wow. Um, wow. So, there were some days when I was legitimately sick, but you, you didn't miss school in my household. Um, and so that, that kind of put me on a path. Uh, and it put me on a path of understanding that uh, you could really do anything that you wanted to do if you showed up, if you worked hard, if you took uh, responsibility for your actions, um, and, and you tried. So that's, that's kind of how I got started. I love it. I think most of us can probably remember early role models, whether it was parents or otherwise who shaped us. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Other than mom and dad and close family members, were there any early teachers or mentors in another form or fashion who you believe had an influence on your later success? Well, certainly uh, all of us are influenced, I think, by you know our elementary school uh, teachers, middle school, junior high, high school, uh, I was also fortunate that uh, I was a halfway decent athlete, so I had the opportunity to interact with, with various coaches. Uh, but quite frankly, it wasn't until college uh, where I was introduced to uh, Dr. James Gripper, who happened to be a counselor at Guilford College. Guilford is a, a small Quaker, Quaker liberal arts institution, uh, 1,500 kids on campus, only about 50 African Americans when I attended. Uh, and Grip, as he affectionately be, be became known as, uh, was brought in to help counsel us 50, 50 black kids in, in a sea of non-people non, uh, of color, if you will. And it was over the next four years where he really uh, poured into me, he really mentored me, he coached me, he reprogrammed my mindset uh, and put me on a completely different track. 
So that was a good segue. He doesn't know, by the way, what questions I'm going to ask, so this is kind of fun for me, probably not as fun for him. Um, I want to talk about the sports thing, because for those of you who read Keith's bio, either in our newsletter or on our websites, um, a lot of what he does now I, th I found interesting, because you don't just consider yourself a businessman, you literally consider yourself a coach, a coach of business leaders. Um, and I know those early coaches had a huge impact on you and your trajectory. So talk to us about the influence of the coaches and of just what it was like to be an athlete. Sure, um, and that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I played team sports. I played football, basketball, ran track. Uh, actually wound up going to college on a football scholarship. Uh, and the things that I learned uh, in team sports are things that quite quite candidly got codified in a book called The, the Corporate Athlete. And it, it's, a, it's a whole uh, manifesto on the analogy between what high-performing teams and high-performing athletes have in common with people in the business community who are also considered to be at the top, tops of their games. Mm -hmm. And before I even became aware of the corporate athlete model and analogy, I was living it, right? So fundamentally, uh, teams, get more done than individuals, right? Uh, everyone on the team has a certain role to play, and you need to know what your role is. Uh, you are dependent upon each other for something that's greater than your individual success, okay? Uh, you practice, right? You, you, you prepare. Uh, you know, one of my mottos is, the first time should never be the first time. And in order to achieve that, you anticipate situations, and this is what we do all the time in, in, in sports. You anticipate situations, you, you have plays that you're going to run, and you practice those plays mm -hmm. so that when game time comes and you find yourself in a situation, you know what to do, right? And so all of that was drilled into me from, you know, from age 12 when I first started playing organized baseball at the boys club all the way through high school and then all the way through the collegiate level. Um, Teamwork, preparation, discipline, commitment to others, uh, goal orientation, always having goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, so that just became part of, of who I was. Um, you're talking a lot about leadership and what makes a good leader. Talk just a little bit about your leadership style um, and also, two-part question, what does best case scenario leadership look like in today's post-COVID kind of crazy upside down world? Wow. Um, so my leadership style is best described as uh, being a servant leader. Um, and there are 12 specific elements to being a servant leadership. I'm not going to bore you with all 12 of them. Uh, but I will say that <clears throat> the fundamental difference between being a servant leader and a totalitarian leader, or excuse me, authoritarian leader, or a laissez-faire leader, or a consensus leader, is that your focus is on the individual. Your focus is on the employee and pouring into the employee and making him or her uh, the best that they can be with the expectation that if you take care of your employees, then they in turn will take care of your customers and that in turn will generate positive business returns. Uh, that you are empathetic, uh, that you meet your employees where they are and you treat them as total human beings, not just as uh, uh, a skilled or maybe semi-skilled laborer that just comes into your space and then they go home at night. Uh, <clears throat> that you are focused on the overall well-being of your employees when they're at work and when they're at home. And, and you give them resources and opportunities to, to grow and expand as, as, as individuals. Um, and that you set a tone of respect, you set a tone of safety, you set a tone of um, uh, creating you know, an environment where they can achieve whatever their dreams are. And that might be within your organization or it might be outside of your organization. Because the expectation is, is that if you give and you pour into them, they're gonna give and pour back into you. And that might mean that they grow and leave you, but that's okay because they're gonna leave you better than they came in. And they're gonna talk positively about you, they're gonna talk positively about your company, and they will become recruits for you. So that's, um, you know, that's really, in, in summation, my leadership style. Um, in a post-COVID world, um, you know, things have changed dramatically as a result of, of the pandemic. Uh, it has put us uh, in places and in situations where, particularly here in, 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 um, in America, that we've, we've never had to experience before, except, I guess it was 1918 uh, with, with the big, big flu. Um, and so what it, is, what it is required is that leaders take a hard look at themselves 
and challenge the existing paradigms that they had been groomed into or had they, they had found to be successful in the past. For example, uh, requiring people to come into an office in order to get things done. Mm -hmm. Technology now allows us to literally be anywhere in the world and still connect with people and communicate and, and get things done. And so it, it does not require you to physically be in one space in order to operate as a team, in order to contribute, in order to, you know, to, to get the job done. But most of today's leaders, particularly in the corporate world, never grew up in that environment, was never trained in that environment, so they have a deep-rooted sense of, well, no, you've got to be here in the office. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um, again, being mindful that your employees are also human beings. They're mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, and they have responsibilities and concerns and issues outside of the job. And when they come into the job, they, they can't check those things at the door. There's, there's no locker that says, I'm going to put all my personal stuff in this locker, and then I'm going to come in and I'm going to be the great corporate citizen, and then when I leave home, I'm going to take this. No, they bring all that stuff in. Mm -hmm. And so leaders today have to have the ability to accept that and give those individuals the freedom and the latitude to handle all of their business during the course of the 9 to 5 or the, or the 3 to the 11 or whatever the shift is, recognizing that as long as they are clear in terms of what their expectations are, the work will get done. You know? That's good. Um, and then the last thing um, is just being kind. Um, you know, there's, uh, there, there's a mindset out there that the boss has to be strict and hard and, and you've got to follow the rules and, you know, there's consequences for not following the rules. And, you know, you either line up and get on the train or you're going to get run over or you're going to get shown the door. Uh, that kind of binary approach to leadership uh, is dead. It, it, it just does not work anymore, right? You have to be flexible. You have to be uh, open-minded. You have to be um, creative in terms of understanding why people actually work. It's not always just about the money. Oftentimes, it isn't about the money. Certainly, we need a certain amount of money to maintain our lifestyle and, and meet our, you know, our basic needs. Uh, but particularly, you know, the, the more recent generations, they have other expectations. They're looking for uh, fulfillment. They're looking for um, ways to contribute to society. They're looking for causes that they can pour into that go far beyond just having a job. And so as a leader, particularly in a corporate setting, or in a nonprofit setting for that matter, um, you need to be mindful of that and be thinking about how you can create opportunities either directly related to your particular business or profession or outside to give people that opportunity to feel like they're contributing something more than just hours in a day. No, I 100% agree and I think a lot of our members do too because I'm looking across the room and I see a lot of entrepreneurs okay. who aren't bound and are happy that they're not bound to that, that nine to five and that's why they're at the club because it gives them the chance to work remotely and get their work done and still do all the things you just said. Um, you talked a little bit about the next generation. Mm -hmm. I heard you say that twice. Um, and I know from following you on social media um, about your involvement work with Best Academy. So a show of hands so that we'll know how deep to take this question. How many of you are familiar with the Best Academy in Atlanta? Okay. Less than half the room. So can you share a little bit about that organization and and your work with them? Sure. So uh, I have the honor and privilege of serving as the chairman of the board for the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. We are the premier uh, nonprofit mentoring organization focusing on African American youth in Metro Atlanta. Um, about 12 years ago, uh, we adopted Best Academy, uh, which is a single sex, all male, um, uh, it actually goes from sixth grade to 12th grade. Uh, it's in the 30318 area code, which is the most impoverished area code, uh, not only in the state of Georgia, but in the southeast, um, in terms of e economic disparity, uh, crime, so on and so forth. Uh, and Best Academy is uh, a, a beacon. Uh, it, is a, it is a haven of academic excellence. Uh, and so the 100 black men, uh, through an umbrella program that we call Project Success, uh, we deliver most of our programs through Best Academy, although all APS students, all uh, Atlanta public school students, are eligible, including women. A lot of people don't understand that, although it, the name of the organization is 100 Black Men, uh, about 30%, maybe as much as 40% of our students who come through our programs are young ladies. Um, and so that's where we focus most of our, our uh, community giving and deliver most of our programs. 
know that, so I learned something new too. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your broader leadership role within the 100 Black Men, because I know that was initially how you and I talked. Mm -hmm. You were getting ready to come into that um, office, and I was really excited because I know the work the organization does is profound, and it's very different from some of the other nonprofits in Atlanta. Can you talk to us about that organization at large, and then how your new role is going to hopefully shape it to be even better? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I mentioned the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. There are actually 104 chapters of the 100 Black Men organization around the United States in the Caribbean, uh, and we actually have one chapter in London. So we are truly an international organization. Uh, we are 501c3, mm -hmm. um, and again, our, our uh, primary thrust is around mentoring. Uh, but we have four uh, pillars of programmatic thrust. We call them four for the future. One is mentoring. Two is educational excellence, three is economic enhancement and empowerment, and four is health and wellness. So all of our chapters, regardless of where they are, uh, all have programs, defined programs that fall into each of those four headings. Uh, here in Atlanta, I'm fortunate to, to be part of the Atlanta chapter. The Atlanta chapter was the second chapter that was actually formed of those 104 chapters around the United States. The first chapter was formed in New York City. Um, and because Atlanta is Atlanta, home of the Civil Rights Movement, home of a lot of legendary entrepreneurs um, and, and African American political leaders, the Atlanta chapter uh, has grown to be the flagship entity out of all those 104 chapters. Every sitting mayor, uh, with the exception of our two female mayors, Shirley Franklin, Franklin and Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, have been members, active members of the 100 Black Men. Uh, most of the captains of industry, both in the corporate world as well as the entrepreneurial world, uh, are members of the Atlanta chapter. Uh, and because of that, because of the, the reputation and the cash of those members, the organization itself has been elevated. Um, the 100 of America uh, corporate office is also located here in Atlanta. And three of the last five board chairs for 100 of America have come from the Atlanta chapter. Uh, so again, there's a, there's a pipeline there, there's a pedigree there, just, just because we are also the largest of all the chapters. We have almost 200 members. Uh, we have a paid staff. Uh, many of the chapters are not that large in terms of being able to have revenue to have a paid staff. But what that does, all, all of that said, what that does is it empowers us to have a broader impact in terms of the students, in terms of the community in which we serve. Um, literally, right around the corner, I, I had another meeting at, at 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, former uh, Surgeon General, uh, Dr. David Satcher, is meeting with some of our um, uh, members who we formed an anti-violence committee. Wow. Uh, and we're in the process of planning an anti-violence symposium. Uh, and Dr. Satcher is a member of the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. And so that's the type of connectivity and the type of power and the type of synergy that our members bring. But again, the focus is on how can we improve the community? in which we serve? How can we help pour into making the lives of African American youth, both men and women, better through mentoring, through educational enhancement, through economic empowerment, and through health and wellness? I love it. So speaking of improvements needed, you just touched on violence. Um, what other challenges in your many roles and in all the hats you wear um, are you seeing or most emerging right now or most critical? Sure. Um, the, the, the first one is just mental health. Uh, the, uh, going, again, going back to the pandemic, uh, you know, a lot of our students uh, come from the lower economic strata. Uh, many of them uh, come from, I'm going to say, non-traditional households where there isn't a, a, a traditional mother, father, you know, son, daughter, whatever in the household. It may be uh, a grandparent, it may be a relative, um, uh, it may be a friend, um, and school. Uh, was not just a place where they went to get educated. It was school was a place of respite. It was a place where, uh, where they could go and get a hot meal, uh, get away from their, their their home community, which may not have been the most supportive, may not have even, even been safe. And the pandemic shut all that down. And it forced them to have to stay in that environment. Uh, and that, that isolation that was created when they didn't have access to their, their teachers and administrators, they didn't have access to their other students, uh, just precipitated a rise in depression, uh, attempted suicide, actual suicide, um, other psychological and emotional behaviors that uh, really has not subsided as the, as the pandemic has subsided. Uh, because African Americans tend to index lower than majority individuals in terms of accessing 
mental health and, and health care. It's not that uh, there is a greater predominance of mental health issues in the African American community compared to other communities, but we index lower in terms of accessing uh, the, the mental health uh, uh, um, solutions, right? Uh, and so these things go undiagnosed, they go untreated, and then they start to manifest into you know, more severe. Uh, so, th so that's number one. Uh, number two uh, is the technological divide. Um, if you don't have access to Wi-Fi, uh, if you don't have you know, a smartphone, if you don't have a computer, uh, how in the world can you actually function? Um, and, and believe it or not, just you know, five miles to the east of here, uh, there are communities in the 30318 zip code where they don't have Wi-Fi, right? Uh, and they don't have computers, they don't have laptops, they don't have smartphones. So just think about, you know, just on your day-to-day -day basis, how much information, how much access to what's going on, not only in your community, the United States, but the world, that they don't really even have access to. Um, and so that is a significant barrier to their uh, professional and personal growth and development because they, you know, they, they are, are behind so severely on, on technology. Um, and then the third thing, which uh, has been talked about a lot in, in the Atlanta community, um, if you are born and raised in Atlanta, uh, you have less than uh, a 6% chance of actually growing out of the economic strata in which you were born in. Uh, the poverty and the income uh, disparity in Atlanta is, is you know, like, again, within the top, top 10 in the nation. Uh, and so trying to figure out how we can break that cycle of generational poverty, which uh, is, is not just on the financial side, it's also on a cultural and a mental and emotional side as well. Um, so those are the three things that, that we're really focused on uh, within the 100 black men of America and the 100 black men in the left. So those challenges, I know for me, um, can sound insurmountable or seem insurmountable um, if we as an audience and also we as a club um, wanted to be able to support you in your work um, in this new role, what would that look like? How can people get involved? Sure. Um, so again, a, a, a lot of these societal problems are really, they're so big and so complex. Uh, at first glance, people say, wow, you know, again, you know, it's too hard, it's too, hard, it's yeah. too overwhelming, what can I do? Well, again, um, people don't really understand the value of just showing up. Uh, our motto in the 100 is what they see is what they'll be. So just exposure. Yeah. Um, if, if all you're exposed to are uh, gangs or people working out their problems through violence or uh, drugs or, or whatever, and you don't know that there are other people who look like you who have lives that don't look anything like, then you don't even know that exists. Correct. Right. Yeah. So there is significant value that is, is not really understood just by showing up and just by having a conversation so that the kids can see and touch you. Just like what we're trying to do here now, as opposed to watching something on television or the movie theater, which they know is fantasy. Right. Like, do, do, do people like you actually exist? Yeah. So yes, so that's number one. Um, number two, open up your doors to allow those people and their parents to, to come in. Um, and whether that's for you know a, a free meal or a lunch and learn or um, just again being able to understand that they are welcome. That's right. Uh, there there is a, there is a mindset in certain segments of the community that that they are less than, mm -hmm. uh, and because they are less than, then they're not <clears throat> welcome or they're not wanted, and that gets reinforced, and so they they start to coalesce around a, a defeatist mindset. And so just breaking that mindset is, is so important because it, it, it frees them to, to want to dream. It, it frees them to have ambition. It frees them to think beyond what they've been able to see and do. Um, employment, I mean, if there are internship opportunities available, I mean, we have a collegiate pipeline program, and so we're constantly looking for employers uh, to, to provide internships for our collegiate students. Um, whether they're paid or unpaid, we prefer that they be paid. Right. Uh, but, but still, just, just, just that exposure. So, you know, those are three really easy things. But just, just, being, just being open to, to having a conversation Absolutely. goes a long way. That's why there's not a podium right here, right? It's all have to access. So speaking of dreaming and feeling inspired, what or who inspires you these days? 
Oh, wow. Uh, well, I got to say, you know, my mom and my parents. Uh, my mom is 88 years old. She is a, uh, uh, a four-time cancer survivor. Not wow. one, not two, not three, but four. Um, and, you know, the thing, some of the things I remember growing up was just the, the attitude that my, my parents had. My, my parents em embodied an optimistic attitude. I never really heard them uh, complain or, or moan about stuff. It was always, you know, a kind of a can-do, we can do, you know, sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I took all that for granted until I left home. That's right. uh, because that's not really that common, uh, if you will. Um, my wife, um, you know, we are, we are equally yoked in many respects. Uh, but but she she has ambitions that that you know, supersede my own, uh, and I'm oftentimes just amazed at, at the things <clears throat> that come out of her mouth uh, and the things that she thinks about and the things that she dreams about that are beyond the things that I would dream about. And so I'm, I'm like I'm holding on to her coattail to try to, <laughs> to, try to ride up to the stars. Um, my, my my two daughters, Hershey and Cameron, they they are uh, exceptionally brilliant in their own capacities, but they come from a different generation. And the conversations that we have uh, about sexuality, the conversations that we have about capitalism, which kind of blows my mind, uh, the, the conversations that we have about, about politics and so on and so forth, is so fundamentally different yeah. than the, you know, the generation that I grew up in. And, and they challenge my paradigms, and they keep me, they keep me relevant. They, they keep yeah. me fresh. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they, they keep me sharp. So, so certainly, you know, the, the, the women in my life, the four women in my life, uh, are, are a key motivator for me. Uh, outside of my household, um, you know, I look back at uh, historical figures like uh, Paul Robeson. Uh, Paul Robeson is uh, one of my heroes. Uh, he was one of the original Renaissance men. Uh, he was a college graduate. He uh, Graduated from law school, he was a four-star athlete and played football. He was a world-class uh, opera singer, baritonist. He was a social activist. Wow. Uh, he traveled the world, um, and so what Paul Robeson uh, did for me was actually embody what can be done if you just choose to go do it. Um, and you know, he lived. Uh, I think he. I think he died in 1976. And I think he was born in something like you know, uh, you know, 1910 or 1915 or something like that. Uh, but he was a true Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. um, and the the things that he excelled in were were varied and diverse. And and he was a worldwide figure at a time when we didn't have the internet and we didn't have social media, right? Uh, and I'm just so in inspired by what he chose to do. Mm -hmm. So. Past and present. So. And future. And future. Yeah. Alright, I got one more question for him and then we're gonna turn it over to you guys. So hopefully your your brains are turning right now. You get ready to take well, I guess you're in the new office and mm -hmm. you're getting ready to move forward with that. Um, what do you want Atlanta to know you as? Like what do you kinda want your I because when I think of you I think of kind, you seem endlessly patient, you're very um, optimistic every time we and I've interacted, you're very like can't Right? I, can, I can sense that from your mom. Like, we can get it done, it's possible. Um, but what do you want kind of like your, your legacy to be in Atlanta? Wow, uh, that, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I ended up a good one, <laughs> yeah, right? That's a great question. Um, I, I think first and foremost, uh, someone who was committed to excellence mm -hmm. uh, in everything that, that, that I did or that I tried to do. Uh, someone who was uh, focused on leaving situations better than, than he found them. Uh, who was always trying to make a contribution. Um, someone who um, had ambitions uh, and, and was looking for ways to create opportunities where everyone could, could benefit. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in a growth mindset, not a deficit mindset. Uh, and I'm a big believer that there, there are no limitations on what can be done and what can be achieved. Uh, and so that does not mean that there's only room in the boat for one person. There's room in the boat for everybody. Uh, and then when we uh, exceed that capacity, then we'll go build a bigger boat. That's right. You know? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then we'll keep it moving. So um, someone who uh, could be trusted, uh, someone of, of high integrity and how high moral uh, aptitude, um, and someone who, uh, you know, who took chances, you know, like uh, taking a microphone when I know I can't sing, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and trying to show and demonstrate some love to my wife in front of 600 of my closest friends. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We came full circle back to the beginning. Yeah. Well, I, I am feeling inspired, so thank you for sharing.
sharing a little bit about your story and your past and your personality and your present and your future with us. I'm going to turn it over to these guys. If you guys just want to pop your hand up, I'll call on you um, and we'll do some Q&A. All right, Nakia. Um, back to you. My question is something a comment that you just made uh, about your commitment to excellence. Mm -hmm. and I'm always curious about what that means to different people. What do you consider excellence? Great question. Um, so for me, it is doing the best you can uh, and, and giving the most that you have to give in every single instance, in every single interaction, in every single endeavor. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Aristotle, and it's simply this, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. So some people turn it on and turn it off you know, at different times, just depending on, on what the situation is. Uh, and my attitude is, if, if you feel like you gotta turn it on and turn it off, in the times that you feel like you have to turn it off, you probably shouldn't be doing that. That's good. Right? You probably shouldn't be engaging in that. So, uh, and you know, every situation is a little bit different, but I, I try to walk away from every encounter, everything that I do, feeling as if I gave my all. And if I gave my all, then I have at least hit that minimum threshold of excellence. That's good. I hope you guys are taking notes, or somebody please be tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else do we have? Right here. Keith, I know you as being an extremely ambitious individual, and I know that you show up in everything you do. Um, i like to hear, how do you find balance? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think balance uh, is, uh, is a, a myth, <laughs> if you will. Um, I think that what you have to find is your center. Um, and, and to me, it starts with your values. You have to know what your values are. Um, and then it becomes choices and consequences. So that every choice that you make, you recognize that there are consequences and, and you, you use your values as a filter by which to decide what, what to do. And so let's just talk about time, right? Um, I can choose to, to get 10 hours of sleep at night which means that that only leaves a certain number of hours to do whatever it is that I'm gonna do during the day. Or I can choose to get five hours of sleep at night, right? And that it gives me more time to do things. Now, there's gonna be consequences to that, but, but fundamentally, um, what your priorities are and how you choose to invest your time, which is your most critical and precious resource, yeah. is a choice. And so I choose to operate on less sleep, because I am in energized and emboldened by the opportunities that are in front of me and I, I want to keep doing, I want to keep achieving, I want to keep pouring it in. And it's, it's, you know, there, there's a trade-off someplace. So I don't, I don't seek balance, if you will, particularly as it relates to, 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 to that dimension. Uh, what I do seek balance in um, is self-care, right? So, so I fundamentally believe that you have to prioritize taking care of self. Mental health, physical health, emotional health. And you may say, well, that, that sounds a little selfish. Well, it is selfish. But my attitude is, if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of anybody else. I can't take care of my wife. I can't take care of my family. I can't take care of the 100 black men. I can't take care of my mentees. So I have to be in tip-top shape. This goes back to the corporate athlete model, right? Um, but that's a choice that I make. And I recognize that there are consequences to that choice. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. This is a great question and a great answer. All right, wife, let's hear from you. Well, well really, my, my, it's not a question to Keith. You've talked a lot about your leader in the nonprofit space with the 100 black men, but we have a lot of entrepreneurs in here. So I'd love for you to just share a little bit about our journey as franchisees because I think that they might find that interesting. Sure, uh, and thank, thank you for that. So um, I spent 35 or so years in corporate America. Uh, about 15 of those years in the financial services and banking industry and the balance bouncing around between managed care companies and consulting companies. Um, and it wasn't until 2014 where I finally got the courage to uh, retire, at least from that world, uh, and launch my first company. So my first company, which is still in existence now, is called Coaching Catalyst. Uh, I am an executive coach. We do leadership development, facilitation, keynote speaking, and a little bit of training. Uh, Charmaine and I launched that company in 2014. 
Uh, I love executive coaching, and, and fortunately, you know, I, I'm pretty good at it. Um, but we were also looking for other things to do because we're, we were about growth, and we were about expanding, and we were about diversifying our revenue streams. Uh, so one of our business, one of our great friends came to us about three and a half years ago with an opportunity to um, uh, acquire the development rights to a franchise called Jersey Mike's, Jersey Mike Subs. Uh, so Charmaine and I and another couple, we own the development rights uh, for the city of Atlanta for Jersey Mike's. So we have two stores open now. We literally just signed the lease for the third store last week. Um, once we get the third store open, then we're going to turn our attention from uh, opening the Novo stores to acquiring existing stores. Uh, there are about 80 to 90 Jersey Mike franchises throughout the state of Georgia. So, uh, so we want to get we want to get about 25 of them. That's awesome. Okay. So you can also support by going to eat at Jersey Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought I saw another hand at this table. Was that I was you? Just, yeah, I was just going to say, um, so y'all forgive me, I just constantly hear you saying the deficit mindset, and I hope you write the book. <laughs> okay. Woo! <laughs> I well, that, that'll, that'll be the third book. The, yeah. the first book is about two chapters away okay. uh, that Charmaine and I have been co-authoring for a while. I love it. Uh, the second book is going to be on feedback. Uh, I'm a big, big believer in feedback, uh, and I believe that both in corporate America and in the nonprofit space, and particularly we as African Americans, uh, we don't get the benefit of feedback. And um, a lot of careers have been derailed, uh, and a lot of success has not been achieved because we did not get the feedback at the time when we needed it when we could correct. Mm -hmm. And so the book title will be All Feedback is Valuable but not all feedback is valid. Ooh, I like it. Because you have to be able to discern what you're going to react to, right. but you don't have that choice unless you get the gift of feedback to begin with. Yeah. Right. So then it'll be the third book. <laughs> we need the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? <laughs> all right, we're gonna do here with the last question, and then I'm gonna let you guys come up and take pictures with Keith, and you guys can meet him for yourself. Okay, so my question, you spoke on reprogramming your mind, and you know, being coached, how are you helping kids, the youth, make their paradigm shift, especially when the most important thing to them is, you know, not shifting our mindset. How are you getting through to them at such a young age? Uh, it, 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 every individual is a little different, and you, you have to, one, just sit and listen to them and build the relationship to really just kind of understand what the issues that they're dealing with right now. I mean, some, some kids are at a point where literally every day, they don't know if they're gonna survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not about, am I gonna go to college? It's not about, you know, am, am I gonna you know, get a job? It's like, am, am, am I gonna survive the night, right? Um, and so, you know, first and foremost, it's, it's meeting them where they are and not coming with preconceived notions about what they ought to be doing, or what they, what, what they aren't doing, or what you can do for them. It's just really just sitting, listening, and understanding what's going on with them. Um, the second thing is consistency. Uh, there, there's a lot of transient type of, of relationships in, in a lot of the kids' lives. People come and go all the time. And so they've learned not to trust. They've learned to have low expectations of particularly adults and authority figures. Um, and so, you know, that first time that you meet them, uh, they're like, yeah, hey, you Mr. Miller, how you doing, whatever. Because uh, they don't really expect to see you again, uh -huh. right? Uh, and then when you show up the next week, they're like, oh, wow, you, you know, you're, you're, you're back. But you're still, that's only twice, right? So after the fourth, fifth, or sixth time, when they say, oh, this, this guy, this guy's for real, that's when they really start to open up. Because they don't, they don't want to invest, they're like any, any other human, they don't want to invest in, in, in a relationship that is not going to be around for a while. Um, but fundamentally, when, you know, what I try to do is I really try to ask them um, open-ended questions just to get them to talk. Um, a lot of people, even, even kids, you know, sixth grade, eighth grade, or whatever, um, nobody's ever listened to them. They, nobody's ever listened to them. They, they've just been, they've been dictated to, they've been shouted at, they've been oppressed and depressed. Uh, but just having someone that they can open up and just talk to. And then you just find that they do have dreams, they do have aspirations, and, and they do have interests. And then once you start to hear what they are, then you start to engage on the things that are important to them. Yeah. So. It's deep. It's a process. It is a process. process. It's a commitment. Well, yeah. 
thank you for your servant leadership and sharing a little bit about your heart with us. And if you guys want to come up and talk to Keith or thank him yourself, now is the time to do so. And thank you. I'll give you yourself a round of applause.